Okay. Uh, th thanks a lot for this uh, introduction. Can you hear me? Everybody can hear me. It's okay. This way it's better, maybe. Okay. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for putting together this uh, very nice uh, meeting. I'm really, really happy to be here and have this opportunity to share a bit of this uh, passion I have for quantum computing, quantum information theory, and uh, of course its application to uh, quantum chemistry. Uh, as uh, Emmanuel said, my name is Sal, and uh, I'm, I have a little bit uh, a different background, yes, indeed, compared to, to Bruno, because yes, I did in, uh, a PhD in, uh, in quantum physics, and it was originally dedicated to the, uh, I would say, quantum information theory, but more oriented on the hardware part. I was uh, interested in the, the transport, the quantum transport of information between two um, components that you can have, for example, in the quantum computers. And I was particularly interested in uh, how to efficiently delocalize this information, so the state of a qubit, for example, in the presence of noise. So it's also related to what uh, Thomas was talking about yesterday, the, the fact that, well, uh, you have noise in quantum computers. So that was the type of thing I was interested in when I was uh, doing my PhD. And then with the uh, opportunity to go for postdocs and other things, I, I wanted to keep on working in the, in the field of quantum information theory, but not necessarily uh, only on the hardware part. I wanted to open to uh, the second part, that is the software part, where you develop quantum algorithms for practical things. And it was also the opportunity for me to learn a lot about quantum chemistry. And uh, for today's talk, actually, I'm going to uh, dedicate this lecture to uh, the development of quantum algorithms. So I will not necessarily talk about uh, the work I realized in, about quantum hardware for quantum computers, but more about quantum software. So the algorithms with a perspective on wave function theory and density functional theory, which represents two very uh, well-known methods in electronic structure and more specifically in quantum chemistry. Let's go. Uh, in, uh, as a first part of this talk, I would like just to give an introduction and motivations about uh, why we are interested in uh, using quantum computers for uh, electronic structure problem. But essentially there I would like to realize a, um, a reminder of all the uh, most important points that uh, have been introduced yesterday so that we, we all warm up and we all get ready then for the more uh, involve the development that I'm going to present. So, uh, as mentioned yesterday, when we are working with a quantum computer, or at least when we have the perspective of using quantum computer, well, you have to change the paradigm uh, about how to manipulate information and uh, we replace the so-called classical bits by the qubits for quantum of bits, which is nothing but a two-level system. So, hardware-wise, there are many ways to uh, create a qubit, you can use a Rydberg atom, you can use photons, uh, you can use magnetic molecule for molecular spin qubit. As soon as you have two uh, levels that you can currently control and put in different superposition, well, you have a qubit and you have your fundamental unit of information. And as mentioned yesterday also by Bruno and Thomas, the thing that we, we do with this is that we gather uh, all the qubits in the so-called qubit register and uh, the idea here is well, we are going to play with the state of the qubits, create quantum superposition, entanglements between them, so that at the end of the quantum circuits, we create a very uh, complicated state of the ensemble of the register that has to be used to solve a complex problem. For this, well, this quantum circuit, it's a, a pretty uh, efficient way of seeing things, but it's essentially a, a way to represent mathematics we would like to implement, and specifically, the mathematics here are encoded in the so-called one qubit gates and two qubit gates. So we have the example of three uh, one qubit gates, the X gate, the Hadamard gate, which play on the state of a single qubit at a time. And you have also uh, two qubit gates there, such as the control node gates that create entanglements, for example, between the qubit two and the qubit one here. A quantum circuit always has to be read from left to right. Bruno said that yesterday, there is a timeline. You start at t equals zero there and you uh, finish here at a final time, okay? And you start here with an initial state and then with a final state. So what we try to do when we develop a quantum algorithm is to manipulate the states of the qubits to create 
entanglement quantum superposition to correlate the qubits and use finally these states in order to solve an interesting problem. And what we're interested in is essentially to follow the ideas, the original idea of um, Richard Feynman that uh, observed that well, it would be an interesting thing to use a quantum computer to simulate and compute properties of quantum system in the nature because at nanoscale nature is essentially quantum. So what we try to do is to follow these ideas and try to develop quantum algorithms for example to solve problems such as the electronic structure in quantum chemistry and condensed matter theory. So in this field of uh, I would say quantum computing applied to the electronic structure theory a lot of quantum algorithms have been introduced. You have the, the opportunity to, to follow the, the lecture from Bruno yesterday. He talked about QPE, Virational Quantum Event Solver, all that type of stuff. But, well, all this uh, work, they were essentially dedicated to the so-called wave function theory approach. Because, well, it's actually natural. We're playing with a wave function at the end of, of the quantum circuit. Natural thing will be to use the wave function to develop quantum algorithms that can uh, relate to wave function theory, such as, for example, configuration interaction, couple cluster, and all that type of stuff. But actually, there is also another point of view that we could have in the electronic structure theory, that is the density functional approach. And in this case, there is really not a lot of quantum algorithms that have been introduced to solve this problem with this new perspective. So the, pers the purpose of this talk is, uh, well, to give you an overview of some developments that we realize, uh, particularly in collaboration with Bruno, about two algorithms that uh, focus on two different views there. Two quantum algorithms, the first one of wave function theory, and the second one based on the D DFT uh, perspective. And the two algorithms I'm going to uh, discuss are the uh, state average orbital optimized rational quantum event solver, which is a um, an extended version of the Varshanal quantum Egon solver that Bruno introduced yesterday, and the so-called QDFT algorithm that we introduce for quantum DFT. For both these algorithms, I will try to motivate why we introduce them, how do they work, and also I give some examples of applications we realized on this. So this will be the final uh, goal I would like to uh, fulfill. Uh, with this uh, lecture of 90 minutes and I'm going to follow the following plan. Uh, before talking about the two algorithms that will come in the two last section, I would like to uh, realize uh, an introduction that will uh, serve in order to introduce all the tools that will be necessary then to better apprehend how all these two algorithms work. So in the first part, I will um, start from the regular point of view that most of the people are using in quantum computing when they try to develop quantum algorithm for electronic structure. They start from the qubits and they move to the development of quantum algorithm for wave function theory. Then I will uh, go through this concept of the Varshana quantum event solver again, but with a different way of saying things. I think that is uh, pretty pedagogical to say it again and again because it's a totally new field. So I'm going to go through the Varshana quantum event solver again and I will put some emphasis on different parts that we have not discussed too much, specifically the ANSATS. And uh, uh, I will give you here some, uh, some um, demonstration that will help you, uh, hopefully, to implement your very own uh, Varshana quantum event solver. And then based on the, all the tools that uh, I'm going to introduce there, I will go through the two uh, quantum algorithms. Because I, I want it to be uh, pedagogical, what I would like to do is in the two first parts, I will give a, a quick exercise, but I will go through this with you. And also I will give here the demonstration of how to implement the exponential of uh, excitation operator in a, in a fermionic representation, which plays a key role in VQE, but also in QPE. So with this uh, demonstration I'm going to give you, you will be uh, theoretically capable of implementing your own quantum circuits and then the quantum algorithms that we have discussed so far. Okay, so let's go. Let's start from the qubits and move to wave function theory. So uh, what I'm talking about here is essentially the electronic structure problem. Uh, that is uh, actually the, uh, the quantum uh, problem that gives you access to the chemistry, I would say, of, of uh, molecular compounds. I represent directly here the problem in second quantization. It is 
here the um, electronic structure Hamiltonian that describes how electrons uh, interact together, but also how the latter interact with the nuclei in a given molecular compound. You have a one-body part and a two-body part. The one-body part encodes the kinetic energy of the electrons and how they, inter how they uh, interact with the positively charged nuclei. And you have the two-body parts uh, here that have been keeping busy a lot of quantum chemists for around uh, 100 years. Where the correlation stems, and uh, this is here where actually all the complexity of the problem comes from. So we start from this, and what we try to do with a wave function uh, theory perspective is to uh, solve this problem in a brute force way with the wave function approach. If you solve this problem this way, well, you get access to uh, the uh, eigenstates of the problem, the ground state and the excited state, and then you get access to the chemistry of the problem. To solve this, uh, this uh, stationary Schrodinger equation, I'm referring only here to the, the reference that is the configuration interaction point of view. There are many other ways to solve problem with a wave function perspective, but this is the thing that, what, that, that we try to export in a quantum circuit most of the time. So this is here the, the basic of what a lot of people are trying to do in a quantum computing field. They want to export configuration interaction calculation in a quantum circuit and developing quantum algorithm based on that. Why do we try to do that? Why, why are we trying to do that? Because, well, the configuration interaction uh, view is interesting. It's something that provides a, uh, a really accurate description, I would say, of the problem you're trying to tackle. But it is also really infamous because of the exponential wall, which means that this is an approach that you can easily use on small size molecules. But the larger the problem you are trying to solve is, and by this I mean the size of the basis set you're using, the number of atoms you're including in your system, the more complex becomes the problem. And this becomes uh, quickly something that is not practical for a classical computer. The idea here is to realize the linear combination of all the possible electronic configuration or slated determinants of the system. And this scales exponentially with the size of the system. So we try to do this translation between the wave function theory point of view and the calculation in a quantum circuit. How do we do that? We use a mapping that is the following one. Let's imagine that we want to encode the full CI wave function, full configuration interaction wave function of the H2 molecule in the minimal basis, STO3G basis. In this case, we have four spin orbitals that I order this way the alpha spin orbitals followed by the beta spin orbitals. So four spin orbitals. And what we have to do is to encode all the possible linear combination of the configuration of the electrons inside the spin orbitals. So we do something that is the one-to-one -one mapping with a qubit register. We have a problem on the left, quantum chemistry problem, and on the right, we have a qubit register with the same amount of qubits. Four spin orbitals means four qubits. And in this case, the one-to-one -one mapping is the following one. We are going to assume that each qubit will encode the electronic occupancy of a given spin orbital. So what does it mean? In other words, it means that here we will have a system that is the qubit register that will play the role of an auxiliary quantum system that will play the role of the analog of the molecule you are working with the wave function, let's say the full CI wave function of your problem, will be actually the one of the qubit register, the quantum many body states of your real register. So you can directly say the wave function of my molecule is equal to the wave function I get out of my uh, qubit register. Okay, do not hesitate to stop me if something is not clear. I will take time to go into deeper uh, clarifications. And based on this, what is particularly interesting is to observe that in practice we could have several advantages. The first one is that we are going to have an exponentially reduced number of information units. What does it mean? Here, for four spin orbitals, we only have four qubits to encode a complex superposition of slater determinants. I would just like to recall how big can be a CI vector on a classical computer. If you have let's say 
2010 electrons in uh, 10 spatial orbitals, so 20 orbitals, the number of slater determinants you would have to encode is huge in this case. You would have something This is a CI vector, configuration interaction vector. Here, each little box is going to encode a configuration interaction coefficient. How many of them there? Well, it scales exponentially with the size of the system, with essentially the number of orbitals you are working with. How many units of information do we need on a quantum computer? Only n qubits to store the wave function. So this is the very first very important, I would say, advantage that we can have out of a quantum computer. Yes? What, what do you mean, distinguished? We can, we can actually, yeah, that's something that we can do. We, I mean, we distinguish them there already. We say that the alpha will be this one, this alpha with all the spatial uh, extension will be this one, and so on and so forth. Maybe I don't get the, the question. Sorry? They, they, are the, they are different qubits, but with, with the same properties. They are like two-level systems with the same local properties, okay? But we need four of them. Okay? Yes? So in this case, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so this is this convoke the uh, active space representation there. We can use that on a quantum computer, actually. That's the same thing. When you use the active space representation, you assume that some orbitals are always doubly occupied, other ones are always virtual. You can, instead of working with the full Hamiltonian, work with the frozen core Hamiltonian. And then you have an effective Hamiltonian there for which you try to solve the CI vector. You get access to the active, active space representation. That, that's the same thing. This, you simply replace this by active space orbitals. That's it. Okay. Okay. So that's it for the, for the very first point. You have an exponentially reduced amount of information to use to encode a complex wave function. The second point is essentially, we hope that on longer term, we could reach polynomial scaling for configuration interaction calculation compared to the exponential scaling that is usually known on a quantum computer, on a classical computer. But this is something that is still debated. Okay, and we expect actually that we can reduce the, the, um, the complexity of the exponential scaling on classical computer by, by something that is maybe a bit more than something, actually that type of behavior. That's something that people are, are targeting on fault tolerant quantum computers, something that Zachary is going to, to talk about after uh, this, uh, this uh, first talk. Okay. So you have here the perspective of the wave function theory approach with this one-to-one -one mapping and all the ideas behind that. What I would like to do here is a quick exercise so that everybody get woken up because I guess that yesterday's restaurant killed some of the people in the audience. I hope that everybody is going to be happy with this. Okay, so this is a, a little exercise where I assume this one-to-one -one mapping for the H2 molecule. And I start here with a qubit register that is uh, actually here with all the qubits in their uh, zero state. And what I want to do is to implement a quantum circuit with the following gates, two X gates, followed by one Adama gate, and then a two qubit gate, that is the control X gate. The question I ask here to the audience is, what is the final state of this qubit register slash molecule? Because in our mind, this will be the state of the molecule we have. And well, we are going to go through that uh, step by step. I would like the initial state at A, just after the two X gates in B, after the other my gates C, and the final one. And I'm kind with you, I start with the easy thing. Initially, we have all the, the qubits in their zero state. 
So there we can already give a meaning to the state of the molecule. There is absolutely no electrons in the molecule. Okay, is there any, anybody that could tell me what is happening after these two X gates? <coughs> to help you... Oh, I have a lot of... Uh, yeah, okay. I think, I think we, we have people that understand what is happening here. I remind... <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I did not prepare any quiz. It seems to be fashionable <laughs> during these two days. I wanted to be more dynamic also. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> next time maybe. This is the effect of, uh, of the X gate. Sorry? We populate. Well, we already have uh, also the interpretation behind that. Exactly, we populate the state. So it means that after this initial empty state, if I apply X gate here and here, what I do is I put an electron in this spin orbital and another one here which means that I end up with this wave function. Yes? Yes, I have to precise that because yes, ye yesterday also Bruno said that we have different convention. Me, I use a convention that would be more natural for quantum chemists, I guess. You populate from left to right, okay? So, you order from left to right, okay. So X act on, uh, on the first qubit, the first qubit switch to the one value, and on the second qubit, you have EC, you have here one. So this state, how do you interpret it? If you start from Artifoc orbitals, you have here the Artifoc determinant, okay? A bit more complex, what is happening here? Remind the Hadama gates. It's going to be strange here, yeah, what, what we are doing. There are some ideas. I see people with a brain on fire. <laughs> exactly. We occupied with the plus state, the qubit 2. So the plus state. What is the plus state? You already used the lingo from quantum computing, I see. The plus state. You should do some quantum algorithm development, actually. The plus state is, the one, is this one. Indeed, we are creating the plus states on the second qubit, which means that here, we end up with this strange superposition. We have still here the Artifoc determinant, plus another determinant, a bit strange here, we have one more electron. So we have a superposition between the states of an H2 molecule in the Artifoc state, plus the H2 molecule does its charge. This is something we can do in a, with a quantum circuit, in a quantum computer. And this also illustrates that we can play with the number of electrons inside the, the, the register. It's not something that is necessarily fixed. And then, well, the final thing that we do, the control not gate. I used to describe control not, uh, control, uh, not gate or control X gates like this, control X, Q, Q prime with Q is the so-called control qubit where you have the dot and Q prime is where you apply the thing. Okay. And it works like this. I'm going to write it just below. Q Q prime. Q Q tensor product on Q prime plus one one tensor product x on q prime q q the interpretation is that when your your control qubit is in the zero state there is absolutely nothing that is done on the second qubit q prime when the latter is in a one state you have the application of a next gate this is the way we introduce entanglement because it depends on the state of the qubit you are working with so what is the effect of this control x gate on this uh, strange states that I have here, with a charge, part, a charge molecule and a, and a neutral molecule. Oh, I have a... Let's check that. 
this is this was uh, your answer I guess, yeah so well done <laughs> so this is the final state of the qubit register and what you see here is that we resolve the problem of the number of particles we end up with two slater determinants with the same number of electrons by extension the, the same number of ones inside the uh, bit strings we have here but the well the molecule we we describe here is a bit strange because we have a broken symmetry here. If you see here the meaning of this, well, you do not really preserve the spin symmetry of the system. You have here a singlet and then something that is a mix between the singlet and the triplet. So you have here finally something that is, let's say, a strange wave function, I agree, but something that describes linear combination of different electronic configuration. So that was essentially a warm-up. Okay? You have now the idea of what we can do in the quantum circuits. A lot of strange things. We can momentarily break some symmetries. We can finally also break symmetries in terms of number of particles, spin symmetries, and all that type of stuff. What we usually do is, well, we start from this, which is pretty easy. We start here by creating the artifact, and then this we replace this part by something that is more flexible, like variational quantum Higgins solver, or quantum phase estimation, okay? So I would like to talk about rational quantum Higgins solver in this talk. I will not talk about fault-tolerant uh, quantum algorithm. This is something that Zachary is going to do after that. Yes. Yes, yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is uh, what I, I tried to mention, actually. We want something more flexible to solve that type of problem. With, for example, rational quantum Higgins solver, we're going to use NSATs or other types of things to uh, finally end up with a wave function that has a better meaning for the chemistry we are dealing with, necessarily. Okay. Oh, that's a good question. A bound on concerning the number of gates to use in order to generate any wave function. Any wave function with respect to... Okay. Well, the number of gates to use in total. Uh, in this case, what I would like to do is to refer you to the number of gates we use in regular quantum algorithms because with this quantum algorithms, we generate that type of wave function. It should have a meaning for the chemistry you're dealing with. Okay? Uh, in the case of a uh, unitary couple cluster with rational quantum Higgins solver, we need something that scales essentially as N2. With uh, quantum phase estimation, we have something that is uh, more involved and most of the time people say that it scales between N4 and N7, something like that. It is still something that is debated concerning uh, quantum phase estimation. We have some ideas, but well. Yes? Essential, the two qubit gates are, are really fundamental. We cannot do, uh, I would say, interesting things with only single qubit gates. We need entanglement, correlation, quantum superposition, things that mix the electronic configurations together there. So we need this indeed. Yes, that's really important. Okay, thanks for the question. So I, I would like to take some time to discuss the rational quantum Higgins solver. This is something that is not related to long-term quantum computing, but short-term quantum computing. And I would like to explain why people are interested in rational quantum Higgins solver right now. Because, well, quantum computers, such as the one I represent here, they are still really imperfect, actually. You understood that also yesterday with Thomas talking about noise. There is an acronym that people are using that is the NISC acronym for Noisy Intermediate Scale Quantum. That's the usual thing that we say about current quantum computers. And you have two things there. You have noisy and intermediate scale. What does it mean? Noisy means, well, you have quantum decoherence, your qubits are not perfect systems, they are not ideal systems, they are open quantum systems. And naturally they will lose their quantumness, their capacity to develop and maintain quantum superposition and entanglement, which is actually the fundamental key for quantum computing. So that's a problem. And also you have the intermediate scale thing. What does it mean? It means here that we can only play with a few qubits, tenth of qubits, essentially, to realize quantum computing and calculation. So we are restricted here with the hardware. So instead of uh, waiting for very long-term development about quantum computers, people started to prepare themselves with 
the development of quantum algorithm that could fit to that type of restriction we are living right now with emerging quantum platforms. And this is the so-called NISC algorithm or near-term quantum algorithm. There are thoughts to, ta to tackle this problem, to fit into this context, because, well, NISC algorithms, they are developed with uh, the idea of using exponentially fewer resources to, uh, sorry, they are, sorry, sorry, my, my bad. Uh, NISC algorithms, they, uh, they fit into this context and they uh, have this advantage that I presented before that, well, at least we have already this, that is the fact that we play with a number of qubits that uh, represent the unit of information that is exponentially um, less in terms of amount of resources to deploy to realize a, uh, a calculation. So it means that here we have this first advantage I mentioned before with this NISC algorithm. And they are based on a few qubits. I should have said this sentence before. Anyway, they are based on a few qubits. We try to do interesting quantum computing calculation for electronic structure, but only with a few qubits, with the hope that the, the algorithm we developed will uh, be used on that type of noisy platform and circumvent these problems. And also the number of quantum gates is then reduced. And, and finally, we try to play with uh, circuits that have short depth so that the effect of noise is contained. That's a way to circumvent the effect of the decoherence and all the possible noise that kills the quantumness of the system. So these are the, uh, I would say, the point of view that we have when we develop NISC algorithms. I, I guess so. I guess, yeah, it, it, can be, it can be said this way, indeed. Then we have also some clever things that we could do in this case. I mean, uh, I think that uh, Manu was raising her hands uh, about that. Yeah. Exactly. The number of degrees of freedom we can include in the, our calculation is necessarily, it has to be restricted also in this case, indeed. So, well, tackling the problem of infinite system in this case, yes, that's something I've not seen necessarily in quantum computing. We really focus on a specific number of orbitals and try to solve the problem within this context. It's maybe not uh, the best way to tackle the type of problem that you're mentioning. So with this NISC algorithms, well, you have this uh, point. I have also to mention that it's important. The quantum speed up or the quantum advantage beyond this first sentence I mentioned, exponentially fewer resources, there is no guarantee that we have a quantum speed up such as, let's say, quantum phase estimation and fault tolerant quantum computing. But at least with that type of uh, algorithms, we prepare ourselves concerning how to manipulate quantum computers. We are not waiting 20 years, 30 years before everything gets stable to start thinking about how to use that for quantum chemistry or condensed matter theory. It's important to prepare ourselves right now. So with this development, well, we warmed up actually. We get ready for longer term calculation where quantum speedups will arise. Okay, and I, refer you to the, to the talk of Zacharis about fault tolerant quantum computing that promises quantum speed up on longer term. So I'm going to introduce the Weichner quantum Egon solver that is a NISC algorithm. So as the name indicates here, the Weichner quantum Egon solver is a way to find the Egon state of a given Hamiltonian, many body Hamiltonian. And it was thought to fit to the constraint of near-term quantum computers. It works like this. We have a quantum circuit and initially, we prepare, let's say, uh, the quantum uh, bit register in a simple state, such as the Artry Fox state. You know how to prepare this. You put two X gates at the beginning of the quantum circuit. And then what we do, we have here the Artry Fox state. We implement here a unitary transformation, whose role would be to create excitations between the different spin orbitals. This unitary transformation is parametrized with some given theta parameter. And the theta parameter, if I open the black box I put here, there are actually some uh, parameters of some specific uh, single qubit gates, for example. So we have a series of gates here that implements this unitary transformation. And at the end of this circuit, what do we create? We create a state that is a trial state that should be multi-configurational, to use the lingo from quantum chemistry. And uh, that is parameterized which means that we can play on 
the linear combination of Slater determinant will produce at the end of the circuit by playing with the gates inside the quantum circuit. All right? And the thing that we do is, well, we use the variational principle and we try to minimize the energy of the associated state here. We measure the energy at the end refer, uh, with respect to a given Hamiltonian, for example, the H2 molecule here, and we pass this information to a classical computer. So this is here where actually we split the amount of work between two computers, quantum processor and classical processor. The classical processor or computer will have the role to optimize the theta parameter that you have inside the quantum circuit, which means it has to, well, find the best parameters to minimize the energy of the uh, final wave function we produce at the end of the quantum circuit. And you have to do this loop. And in virtue of the variational principle, what you expect is that then at the end of the variational quantum Huygens solver, well, this wave function will be a pretty good uh, approximation for, let's say, the ground state of the molecule which gives access to the chemistry of the system you're interested in. So this is the, the, the regular way of seeing rational quantum Huygens solver. Yes? So, uh, thanks for the question. Several people have realized this. They have implemented Varshanan quantum Huygens solver. A lot of people are doing that right now, actually. I remember a paper where people tried to also include this inside uh, a quantum circuit, and they called that full quantum Varshanan quantum Huygens solver. But I guess that it is really costly, so it's more longer-term development than NISC algorithm. Okay, so you have here um, a perspective, an overview of the Varshanan quantum Huygens solver. Yes, Arnaud? Yes. Yeah, you start again from the simple state, and then you have the effect of this unitary transformation that is slightly changed. And actually, this effect means, this change means that you have a different final multi configurational wave function at the end. Is it clear? D d sorry, D? Yes. Okay, yeah, some of them have parameters. I'm going to introduce them just after that. Okay, I have the pen here. You have some rotation parameters. Let's say rotation Z parameters. I put two theta here because it's simpler and it's equal to... You have a parameter here, a rotation. And that's the type of thing I'm going to use just after that. Okay, okay. So some of them are parameterized in this, indeed. Thanks for the question. And that's, that's the best ones that we are going to play with. So this is the, the overview of the Varshanan quantum Huygens solver. Some people are using Varshanan quantum Huygens solver to do some benchmark for quantum platforms and chemistry, small size molecules. So, but there are also a lot of people that are doing research on different parts of this algorithm. And I would like just to mention some questions that people are interested in. Some people are interested in here, here in the initial state. How to prepare something that is slightly different than Artifoc. Because, I mean, Artifoc is not always the best starting point, specifically in strongly correlated system. So this is essentially a quantum chemistry problem here. And also, I would say, a quantum computing point of view, because here you have to find new initial starting orbitals. But also, I would say here, short depth circuits that could create different states that the art we at the beginning. Let's say a simple singly excited state, something like that. So this is research for some people. Other point, how to efficiently measure the information here. Let's say the energy, because this is something that is really costly in, in a Varshanan quantum Huygens solver. Some people are interested in finding new ways to play with the symmetries of the system to reduce these costs and to make it more practical. This is a question that is more related to, well, the hardware. How to sample more efficiently on the hardware. So more a problem of, I would say, physics, physics point of view. Other people are interested in finding better optimi optimizer because 
here we have a noisy uh, system and well noisy optimizer is actually an important subject of research in information theory classical information theory so you have people from informatics that here play a key role also and finally you have also the question of this black box this sunset which one do we use something that is inspired by what we know from chemistry something that is more um, let's say hardware oriented so here all this simple question i wanted to point out here when we are doing quantum computing, it gathers the knowledge of quantum chemistry, the hardware, classical informatics, and I would say quantum chemistry again, or uh, quantum physics. So here, quantum computing gathers a lot of skills and also a lot of people around a similar problem. And this is, I wanted to share that with you, something I find really beautiful in this field, because where well, a lot of people can, uh, well, participate in this, uh, in this, uh, field in this area. What I would like to mention here uh, is uh, what is realized here. I will leave that uh, away and I will just focus on the ansatz. The question here is, well, which ansatz do we use? Oh, yes, a question. Uh, we are restricted to specific parameterized gates and we have to build everything from this. So this is the constraint we have. Does it answer to you? Hmm? Ah, okay. Okay, Th that's uh, that's another. Yeah, okay. Um, that could be seen also this way. Yes, if you if you do an orbital optimization or something like that, the uh, the theta parameter could be related to this rearrangement of the linear combination of atomic orbitals in this case. So indeed, we can give different meanings. Okay. But there I will essentially focus on the CI, CI, configuration interaction uh, meaning, wave function theory po point of view, without talking too much about the, the um, orbitals for the moment. So I wanted to discuss the ansatz, the, the question of the ansatz, among many other questions that we have in the field for the development of rational quantum events over. Which one do we use and how do we build them? And I would like to take some time to discuss two different ansatz, the hardware efficient ansatz and the unitary copper cluster ansatz. So the first one here is something that is motivated by the hardware. The second one here is something that is called chemistry inspired or physically motivated, something that we know from quantum chemistry and we try to use in a quantum computer. And for the unitary copper cluster ansatz, I will give you a demonstration about how to implement that type of ansatz. Okay. Let's start with the hardware efficient one. So I mentioned here uh, a reference where they use an hardware efficient ansatz to uh, describe properties of uh, small molecules and quantum magnets. If you are interested in this, you can, you can read this, uh, this, this nice paper. Um, hardware efficient ansatz, that's a, a pretty strange name. Hardware efficient because here we are trying to build an ansatz that is based on our knowledge of the hardware and the best gates that you can use on a given quantum platform. And it goes like this. The recipe starts with the first step. We start from a set of gates, and these gates are supposed to be very efficient with respect to the hardware we are working with. What does it mean, efficient? It has a, a lot of meanings, actually. Efficient means that they should be really not expensive. They should be easy to implement and with a strong fidelity, high fidelity. So if you have this knowledge, from the hardware of the quantum uh, computer you're working with, you can design an hardware efficient on that. And for this, let's say you have this rotation uh, gate that is parameterized and the control Z gate, those two gates are super efficient for a given quantum computer. Okay, I'm going to build my hardware efficient on that based on this. And what I do is I create a fragment of circuits like this one, for example, and I call that fragment parameters with theta. This circuit is equivalent to this one, and there, well, I play on the, on the, on the state of the first qubit, and then I entangle the, the state of this qubit with the two other qubits, for example. This is a fragment, and what I do is that I repeat this fragment several times. And I have here a quantum circuit that I can manipulate to encode information, for example, to encode a many-body uh, wave function for chemistry. 
So here you replace the unitary transformation by the series of repeated fragments. And you put that inside the Varshana quantum Megan solver. So what are the pros and the cons of this approach? It is not necessarily expensive with respect to uh, a given quantum computer because, well, it is designed for not being expensive. It is hardware efficient. So that's the good point I would say here. But there's a problem is that here we may break a lot of symmetries. Number of particles, spin of the states we are working with. This is something that we have seen at the beginning of the, of the talk. It's possible, well, to not conserve these things, which is a, a bit annoying. And also it may be, uh, it, it is possible that when we try to solve these symmetries, by for example, increasing the cost function we are working with to enforce playing with the same number of electrons, a given spin symmetry, well, it may be possible that the optimization, the classical optimization becomes really hard. So you have some positive points and negative points with this approach. Let's switch to another type of ansatz. Yes? Yes, we, the, the states are the ones of the qubit register at some point in the circuit. Okay? And this, if you use this type of uh, hardware efficient approach, at the end of the register, there is no guarantee that the number of electrons is preserved. So, by extension, the number of ones in your bit strings, and also the spin symmetry. And it's a bit a pity if you want to work with singlets or a triplet or quintet things. You have to preserve this because for the chemistry you are trying to describe, it's important most of the time. Yes. Yes. That's the type of thing you can end up with. Is it, is it interesting for quantum chemistry application? I don't think so at the end, at the end of the circuit. You have to resolve to choose the number of electrons. So that, that's the, the problem that arises here. Is it, is it more clear now? More or less? Yes. You use it as a classification. Yes. Can we use some classification? Don't use the numeric parameter like choice whether or not the set can be preserved. Set of parameters that describe your yeah. In, yeah. circuit or uh, so in this case in this case, yes, there are there are for example this particular gate with this particular parameters, things that we can implement via the hardware. The, the, the point that you raised that maybe applying or not applying something is an interesting point because it actually encourages developing quantum algorithms with this perspective at some point. To develop uh, things that only apply in a specific way or... Uh, and that's essentially something that, for example, Bruno showed with quantum phase estimation. You have this application of this unitary that is conventional if only if the ancilla qubit was in the, in the one state. And if it is in the zero state, there is no application of this transformation. That is also a thing we can use indeed. It's not inside your qubit. No, there, no, 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 no. This is something that, is, uh, that you can manipulate with the, within the hardware, essentially with the laser pulse. So people are trying, uh, people are, uh, have been using this ansatz actually. So yes, that's the type of thing that people try to do also and to improve. Uh, then the second part of the question is that you talked about fragments. Yes, of course, of course. If you can ensure that, perfect. But most of the time, the motivation, the original one, is based on the hardware. And these gates, well, they are not meant to preserve the number of ones and zero in, in, your, in your bit strings, in, 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 the, in the states you, you generate. You see? Exactly, exactly. But that will be here an hardware efficient and also chemistry inspired. And that's something that is, that is motivated by the physics of the system you want to describe. Here, the ansatz is just an hardware efficient ansatz, which means that you really start from the hardware and everything is motivated by your hardware, regardless the, the problem you're, you're trying to, to solve. You know these two gates are the best ones, you are going to use them by all means. Okay. Not necessarily. No, not necessarily. This is just an ansatz, so that's something that should be flexible enough, in theory, to build many different types of wave functions that could represent the ground state of H2 of any other molecule. 
you are working with. It's not something that is restricted to H2. H2 is here, was here used in this talk essentially as like uh, an, ex an example for, for helping people to uh, follow this. Is it, is it clear? Okay, great. So let's, let's move on. We have this Sensatz that, we, that is motivated by the hardware. Maybe not the best way to proceed. There is another one that is the famous unitary couple cluster Ansatz that is really coming from uh, the quantum chemistry community, where actually <coughs> um, the ID is different. We start from the physics, or should I say the chemistry of the, of the system you are trying to describe, and you introduce an excitation operator. Here, this excitation parameter is associated to some cluster amplitudes. I use the same lingo as in quantum chemistry here, as you can see, the theta here. And the theta are the parameters we are, we are going to play with. And you have here this excitation operator that I call small tau. They can be uh, single excitation, double, uh, double excitators, triple, and so on and so forth. And what you do is you start from this and you create a unitary version of the regular copper cluster approach by creating the big T minus T dagger. That's the unitary copper cluster on that. And if you restri re restrict this to, uh, let's say, single or double excitation, you will end up with UCCSD, for example. And the idea is to implement that in your quantum circuit as an ansatz. How do we do that? As Bruno mentioned yesterday, it is a pretty hard task to do it straightforwardly. So what we do is we invoke the trotterization here, which essentially transforms the summation of uh, the excitation operators into a product of excitation operators. So there you have generally fermionic excitations there, okay? I'm not talking about any qubit things for the moment. Those are fermionic excitations. Creation annihilation operators, to be more precise, okay? Now it's time to translate that into something that we can implement inside a quantum circuit. And what we do is, based on the one-to-one -one mapping, and more specifically the jordan Wigner translation of fermionic creation annihilation operator into qubit operators, well, this will be translated into a quantum circuit. You have here the effect of the jordan Wigner transformation. You have an annihilation operator, creation operator. You end up with the so-called Pauli strings. So chain of Pauli operators, where here you create or annihilate locally zero or one, so an electrons, and there the, sh the chain of z, of z operators is used in order to encode the anti-symmetry of the wave function. So you really have here a way to encode fermionic algebra inside the quantum circuit. We are using this to transform this fermionic part into qubit operators, like this. And you end up with the product of exponential of Pauli strings. So if you know a way to encode this, you know a way to encode unitary copper cluster and that, but also the uh, time evolution operator that uh, Bruno mentioned yesterday, because in this case, the time evolution operator is essentially something like this, where you have here fermionic operators, and you can show that this, in the same way as for the unitary couple cluster that can be, with trotterization, transformed into products of exponential of Pauli strings. Okay? So we have the same type of tools there. And I'm going to explain how to implement that just after this slide. But before that, let's talk about pros and cons of using this compared to hardware efficient and that. In this case, well, the associated circuit has this, uh, this form. It will be product of all this, uh, of, of, of all this particular sub-circuits. And well, the costs of implementing that in terms of number of gates is polynomial. It is related to the question I had at the beginning. The number of gates we have to use to implement this, it is polynomial. So it is more or less good. It depends on the size of the system because, well, with a polynomial cost at some point, well, the circuits can be large, larger and larger, and well, we can suffer from the decoherence effect. So good and bad. But the thing is that, well, it is shown to preserve some symmetries 
among which you have the uh, uh, number of particles, which differ from the hardware efficient on that, which is good in this case. And also, it seems to be simpler to optimize because in this case, well, we have some uh, conserved symmetries. So we are not like playing with the full Hilbert spaces of the qubit. We are playing with a specific subspace where you have a restricted amount of uh, slater determinant accessible. Yes? Thanks for this question. Exactly, yes. Uh, I, yeah, 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 exactly. That's also a waste of information somehow. In the final part of this talk, I will talk about DFT, how to encode things, and we, I will explain how to use the full basis in this case. Thanks for the, the question. You, th this is a universal calculation, which means that you can use this ansatz for any type of molecule. Okay, but the, the optimization of the parameters will differ depending on the problem you're trying to tackle. Okay, is, is this okay? Do you get it? Because it seems that there is something that is not clear in this part. Maybe we can discuss after that more in depth if you want. <laughs> Yes. Okay. At the beginning of the variational quantum Higgins solver, we assume this one-to-one -one mapping, let's say, which means that we have qubits that will be attached to given spin orbitals. But that's at that moment, I do not speak about integrals. I just say this qubit will be this spin orbital. The circuit is independent for, from any information apart from that, from the, the, the chemistry problem. And at the end, you create a wave function and you are going to say, okay, I assume that at the beginning. Now I make here the sampling at the end to measure the energy. And with respect to the original mapping I use, I know finally which qubit will correspond to which orbital. And I can realize here this energy measurements. So this is precisely where actually we give a concrete meaning with respect to a given system because it's, it, it is related to the Hamiltonian we are working with. We do sampling, we measure with respect to the Hamiltonian. This is precisely where we give the final meaning. But in between here, I'm preparing a multi-configurational wave function, and I just assume that this qubit will correspond to this spin orbital, okay? The electronic integrals, the calculations, they are used at the end. We are using the circuits to prepare a wave function. We use this wave function and we give it the meaning that it will encode the electronic occupancies and so on and so forth. You see? Okay. I have 30 minutes, I guess, to, uh, to end uh, this, uh, this talk. I would like to uh, quickly explain how to implement this and then switch to the development of the two algorithms because there, with all of this, you will, you will have all the necessary uh, tools to understand what uh, we can do. So the idea here is that you understood that to implement the unitary couple cluster ansatz, it means that you have to realize the product of that type of exponential of Pauli strings, like this. So here I have, I have an example. Let's say you have this Pauli strings, exponential of Pauli string. You want to translate that into a quantum circuit. Okay? How to do that? What is the quantum circuit to implement this? Because if you have access to the architecture of the circuit, you just have to put it there, realize the product of all the circuits. You have un unitary couple cluster on that, or a totalized version of the time evolution operator. I give you the, the answer here. The shape of the circuit is the following one. I call here qubit A, qubit B, and in this case, you see that you have a central rotation Z operator sandwiched by two control X gates and then by two rotation Y operator. Why this? The central one here, the central operation is uh, actually defined by this exponential of minus theta Z, which I wrote here. Okay, so that's the definition. Then, you have the sandwich of the control X gates. What is the effect of this? Here, actually, the effect is to extend the Z Pauli strings to the second qubit. So you start from exponential of ZB, ZB, and you end up here with this part here with a unitary 
in the, in the blue area that is exponential of theta, z a, z b. Okay? And then if you sandwich again by this two rotation operator, the effect will be to change the z operator into an x operator. Like this. Okay? So you have here the type of recipe we can use to implement this short depth circuit. And then if you concatenate all, all this, uh, all this uh, piece of circuits, you have in the end the ansatz or, for example, this time evolution operator. I think I'm running a little bit out of time for diving into the mathematics of this. So I will give you here the properties that you should use to demonstrate that. And what I propose is that instead of spending time on the board explaining step by step all the, the calculation, I'm going to prepare them on LaTeX. And when I'm going to share these slides, you will also have the demonstration with this. Is it okay for all of you? Great. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. Okay, so you, you have here uh, the recipe to implement that. And then once you have the recipe, well, you can extend that to the three qubits and you can demonstrate that here, the idea is the same. You start from exponential Z and then you extend the Z poly strings to the second qubit and the first one. So there you will have exponential Z, Z, Z for Z1, Z2, Z3. And then you sandwich again things there to transform the Z into Y. So you have exponential of theta instead of Z, 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 you have Y, Y, Y. Same things then. If you use this, you can also do that at home. In this case, I use the same central thing and I just change the uh, rotation around for the sandwiching. This will transform into a Y. In the middle, I do nothing, so I have a Z. And at the bottom, I transform it into an X. So you can do that at home. And convince yourself that it works hopefully or come back to me with questions if it's too hard or you don't see things and i can help you okay so you you know now you know practical things about uh, quantum computing and how to translate a uh, copper cluster and that's let's say in in a, in a quantum circuit i would like to take about excited state calculation that will be the final tool i'm going to use to introduce this uh, two algorithms SIOVQ and qdft Excited state calculations that have been keeping busy people for the past five years in quantum uh, algorithms development because, well, people are interested in ground states, but also there are a lot of cool applications when you switch to excited state calculation in quantum chemistry. So people were interested in developing algorithms in this respect. And I mentioned here just some references. I invite you to, to check to see the different point of view that I've been introduced to get access to excited states and not only ground states with uh, extension of the Weierstrass quantum Megan solver. And that's the algorithm that uh, I developed in collaboration with Bruno to, to tackle that type of problem. Uh, I invite you to check this, this papers. I would like just to mention very briefly this algorithm. Maybe I don't have too much time, so I'm going to skip that, I guess. Um, I will skip this, uh, this slide to focus more on the, on the algorithm and give also sometimes to DFT. This is another point of view that is an iterative algorithm to get access to excited states. Briefly, you get access here to the ground state with a VQE and then you extend the Hamiltonian you are working with by implementing a penalty term to create a projection with respect to the previous states that you obtain. And then you have here a new cost function. And based on that, the new ground state becomes the first excited state. And you do that iteratively. And when you do that, you use the Weichner quantum deflation. And well, th that's the name of the algorithm. You get access to the excited sets iteratively. Cool. Interesting things. That's something that, is, that can be also, I mean, that is also done on classical computer in quantum chemistry using penalty terms. That is a, a famous approach. So, well, good inspiration for uh, the knowledge of quantum chemistry. Now I would like to introduce the SIO VQE algorithm and the motivations of this. This algorithm was introduced because, well, I was interested in the um, in applications to photochemistry and more specifically the description of uh, conical intersection. And uh, they play a key role. They, this element play a key role 
uh, in the context of, uh, let's say, for example, uh, well, photochemistry, photo dissociation, but also photo isomerization, such as the, 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 the thing that I represent here with the azobenzene molecule, where a molecule starts from a cis and switch to a trans conformation. Uh, there are uh, some uh, nuclear relaxation through uh, this uh, specific uh, degenerate point in the potential energy surfaces. The thing is that, well, it is important to locate the conical intersection in spectrum and it's, a non -task. it's known that it is a, a hard task. So it is a cool thing to target for a quantum computer, I would say. It was the main motivation. And uh, several years ago, I observed that actually there were absolutely no algorithm that was dedicated to that type of uh, problem. And that was motivated by photochemistry problem, I would say. So I wanted to, to introduce uh, an algorithm that I call the state average orbital optimized variational quantum gain solver. And these are the features of this algorithm. I wanted it to be VQA-like, to have a hope to export it on near-term quantum computers in the coming decade. And also I wanted to extend the capacity of this algorithm to describe uh, interesting stuff beyond potential energy surfaces, also to get access to gradients and non-adiabatic couplings, which are, I mean, really important information in the context of photochemistry application. So it goes like this. I'm going to be pretty quick. If you want to discuss more about this algorithm after that, I can also. You have a, a molecular system and you start from the active space Hamiltonian of the system. The idea is to find, let's say, the ground and the first excited states of the system in this active space representation. And for this, I propose to use a, a unique circuit to prepare several states. You start from an initial state, and then, with the VQE approach, point of view, you create at the end a first trial state like this, and you measure the associated information, uh, uh, energy. And then you go back at the beginning of the circuit, you change the initial state you're working with, phi b, and you, pr and you produce another uh, multi-configurational state that will be used, for example, to describe the first excited state. Okay? And you measure the energy associated to that. What you do here is uh, to, to have the point of view, the state average point of view. Instead of focusing on the minimization of a single energy, I minimize the energy of s multiple states together. So of this ensemble of states. So here I create a state average cost function and I minimize the ensemble energy. And at the end of this optimization cycle, well, I have a good description, hopefully, of the ground and the first excited state of this initial active space Hamiltonian. So this is essentially the part that is uh, VQE-inspired. And then, based on this, we can get access to the states, but more specifically, the one and the two reduced density, uh, uh, one and the two electrons reduced density matrices. And based on this knowledge, I propose to use a state average orbital optimizer. This part, is, this part on the right is fully on a classical computer. And this is where I play with the orbitals to optimize even more the state average energy by this to reduce even more the state average energy. So I transform here the Hamiltonian I'm working with, I rotate the orbitals, and I optimize the state average energy of these two states here with respect to these new variational parameters that are the rotation of the orbitals. This is something that is known, I mean, on the on a classical computer, you can do that with newton raphson optimization approach, for example. And at the end of this process here, you end up with actually a new uh, Hamiltonian with optimized orbitals. And the idea is to give this new Hamiltonian back to the state average rational quantum Egon solver, so that this part will find again the new ground and first excited state of this new Hamiltonian. And if you do this big loop, this two-step approach SAVQE, state average orbital optimization, you progressively minimize the ensemble energy associated to your two states. And you treat them on an equal footing because it's always in a state average manner. And that was the main motivation for me because I wanted to describe a conical intersection where you have a degeneracy. I give you here uh, an illustration of the results we obtain. This is, I have to mention that, a noiseless simulation. I did not uh, take into account the effect of noise here. Essentially because here, the ansatz I'm using is still too large. 
two long circuits. I'm using a U Nitai copper cluster double generalized ansatz. So it's still a, a circuit that is too large and that should present too much decoherence. For them, uh, right now, I'm trying to find a new way to compactify this, this circuit to export it directly on the quantum computer. But for the moment, this result is a uh, noiseless simulation. And as you can see here, well, the simulation of uh, this algorithm, uh, I mean, present here a, a good description of the conical intersection of this molecule. And after this, I wanted to make this approach more practical, still for photochemistry application. To go beyond the description of potential energy surfaces, somebody that would like to do photochemistry uh, study or implement um, ab initio quantum dynamics, it will need important information such as nuclear derivatives and also non-adiabatic couplings. So this is a, a thing I wanted to, to develop with respect to this algorithm. And uh, actually this is a, a bit problematic because in this case, if we want, for example, to find the analytical derivatives, uh, for, for example, to the nuclear derivatives, so displacement of a given atom, well, there we are working with an ensemble point of view and trying to find the, the, the form of this is hard because it's uh, invoked because of the chain rule uh, you, you have to use in your, in your derivatives. It, uh, it invokes that this should be uh, variational, but it is not here. You have here a dependence of each uh, independent state energy with respect to the orbital rotation, the kappa, and also to the state preparation you have in the circuit. So in order to circumvent this problem, there are the so-called coupled pair tube equations. And I got ins inspiration from the coupled pair tube MCSCF equation, multi-configurational self-consistent field equation. And I tried to export that to the algorithm SAOVQE. And this is all based on Lagrange multiplier. I'm going to be brief on that. Essentially, the thing is to introduce a Lagrangian and to try to circumvent this problem trying to make this Lagrangian uh, stationary respect to this particular uh, parameters that are a bit annoying for me. And it means that you have to solve this equation to find the Lagrange multiplier and to plug them back into your Lagrangian. And this is something you can do because actually the Asian here and the gradient here, they are things that you can measure at the end of the quantum circuit. So if you get access to this information, you can solve this equation, put the Lagrange multiplier back into this, Lagrangian definition, and you can easily derive this and find an analytical form of the nuclear uh, derivatives. And similar stuff can be done for the non-adiabatic couplings. Okay, I give here a quick illustration of what can be possible with this. This is still a noiseless simulation, but in this case, I start from a, a, a strange geometry of the formal dimin molecule, and the idea is to find the minimal energy conical intersection of this molecule, and I use nuclear gradients and non-adiabatic couplings. And in this case, well, you have here what is happening concerning the different steps of this uh, uh, geometry optimization. And what we observed is that at the end, at convergence, we compare this result with the uh, state average KCCF calculation, which is a, a method that is used a lot in photochemistry and we observe that actually the potential energy surfaces we obtain, the final geometry, the non-adiabatic couplings and the nuclear gradients, they were absolutely similar to what we obtained with the state average KSSF method. Which means that this algorithm, you can see that as a very first step for near-term computer, quantum computers, the first step for the development of a quantum analog of the state average KSSF algorithm, uh, which is famous for a photochemistry application. With this, I end up with, uh, with this, uh, this result, and now I'm going in the next 15 minutes to talk about DFT. Okay, so so far I've been discussing uh, wave function theory, multi configurational wave function. Okay, but there are also DFT, another point of view, another starting point in electronic structure calculation. And I'm going to explain how we manage to uh, export this uh, new electronic structure paradigm to the development of quantum algorithms with uh, uh, Bruno. So the main idea with uh, the development of quantum algorithms based on wave function theory is here to uh, develop new methods that could reduce the complexity of getting access to excited state, ground state, 
with a many body picture. So it's, it, we, we mean here that we have the hope with quantum algorithm to make this step. Okay? With the hope that, well, quantum algorithms will be on longer term capable of producing high level description of multi configurational wave functions on larger size molecules. Okay, but there is also another point of view DFT. And DFT is already something, a theory, that we can use on larger size molecules, for example, this one. And the hope that we have, or at least the idea we have, is well, if we expect this step starting from the wave function theory, couldn't we expect this parallel step starting from this new paradigm that is DFT? Which means that if we use here a quantum algorithm that would implement quantum, uh, DFT, maybe we can, on longer run, hope for the application of DFT-like calculation on systems that uh, make you dream, such as uh, protein, let's say. How did we do that? Well, first, I would like to quickly recall what is different between DFT and wave function theory. We start from an initial system. Originally, what you would like to do for gaining access to the ground state is to solve the many body problem. So you have an interacting system. DFT, no, we do not do that. It's not interacting system. We assume that we work with a fictitious non-interacting system. And here you replace the focus on the many body wave function by a new focus on the electronic density. And to get access to this, we can use the Consham self-consistent equations, practical way to implement DFT. And uh, you uh, get access to uh, a description of the electronic density by the so-called Consham orbitals. And to find the Consham orbitals, how do we do that? We have to do that in a self-consistent way, find here the, uh, the eigenvectors, the Consham orbitals, uh, that are the eigenvectors of the so-called Consham Hamiltonian, which is a single-body Hamiltonian, where you include here the effect of the exchange correlation functional, and you do that in a self-consistent way. And at the end of this self-consistent loop, you, you have, uh, assuming some approximation here, because you use a functional, a description of the ground state of energy of your system. So that's essentially the, the new paradigm. When you, when you use a DFT calculation on a, a classical computer. The idea we wanted to, to develop is to export this point of view on a quantum computer. How did we do that? Well, I remind you that when we start with an interacting system, wave function theory, we use a mapping that is, if we start with n spin orbitals, you have to work in the end with n qubits, and you get access to the Egan state, many body state. If we now switch to the Consham view, DFT view, let's say, the idea is to replace the interacting view, the interacting system uh, point of view, by a fictitious non-interacting system. And what we sh demonstrated with Bruno is that, well, we can find a new mapping on a quantum computer that reduces exponentially the amount of resources you need to describe the electronic structure problem, which means that you switch to a new paradigm that is already famous to be really convenient for classical computer. And by simply moving to quantum, comp quantum computing, you demonstrate that you, you can also gain in terms of resources to use to do the calculation. And in this case, we demonstrated that we only need log 2n qubits to resolve the DFT problem on a, classic, on a quantum computer and giving you access to Consham orbitals. And it goes like this. You have the Consham matrix that you express in a given uh, local atomic orbital basis, let's say. And this is the uh, non-interacting n-spin orbitals we have here. So we try to find the Consham orbitals, non-interacting system. The idea is to use a new mapping, totally different from what we use in wave function theory when we try to export this problem on a quantum computer. This time we start from this non-interacting problem, and what we use is the full computational basis now to map the problem, to uh, uh, refer to your, your comments earlier, we are not using efficiently the Hilbert space. Here we are using the full Hilbert space that is accessible by the quantum computer. So imagine that you have a system with eight sp spin orbitals. How many qubits do you need to map the, this problem on it? If they are not interacting, this, if the problem is not interacting, what we can assume is that each spin orbital will be associated to a given computational basis state. And in the end, how many qubits do we need? Three, three qubits. Because here we have 
eight molecular orbitals, spin orbitals, let's say alpha uh, spin orbitals. In the end, we can map the entire problem on only three qubits, which reduces a lot the um, amount of resources you need to solve an electronic structure uh, problem. And the idea is that actually, if you do this mapping, you end up with a kind of a new representation of the Hamiltonian, let's say, that becomes uh, an auxiliary Hamiltonian interacting one. Because here you have interacting qubits with different uh, type of interactions between the different computational basis states. It is a bit counterintuitive, but well, as you can see, it leads to a drastic redu reduction of the amount of resources we need. And uh, well, how do we find the Concham orbitals with this mapping? We start from the molecular system. We use this mapping. So we end up with a new representation of the Hamiltonian in the computational basis. And this is now our reference Hamiltonian from which we are going to extract information. And what we do, we use a state average VQE approach. There, we start from different initial computational bases, and we use the same unitary to produce different Concham orbitals. We exactly the same tool as before, as in SIO VQE. But this time, I'm not talking about multi configurational wave function. So here you can see, I can reuse some knowledge I have from wave function theory. In this case, I can use the same type of approach. And at the end, if you minimize the ensemble energy associated to the to this specific state, the number of states you use is equal to the number of spin orbitals you assume to be occupied, because those spin orbitals are the ones that will give you access to the electronic density in space at the end. If you get access to this uh, prepared state at the end, here you have an estimation of the electronic density, and you can close the loop and do the con-sham self-consistent calculation. And I give you here uh, some, that's the final slide of the results how we proceeded, we use an hardware efficient ansatz. You now know what is an hardware efficient ansatz. Why did we use that? Because we don't need any specific meaning here. All the computational basis is used. We don't need any chemistry inspired things to, um, to prepare our circuits. There, we use an hardware efficient ansatz and we hope that we can spread um, over the full Hilbert space accessible and proposed by the qubit register. And in this case, this is the fragments I use, and I repeat with the uh, parameters, and I use this and that, four, four fragments, we use four fragments. So it was around like 50 gates, 15 gates. Really, really short depth circuits, something that we could in practice implement on a quantum computer. We use the stl 3 g basis, LDA functional, this uh, optimizer, the four layers, and that's the type of result we obtain here. You have the full CI calculation, so multi-configurational calculation exact in the stl 3 basis, just as a reference. You have here the DFT calculation realized on a classical computer, okay, with the cyan uh, full curve. You have here the QDFT algorithm we implemented, assuming that there is no noise. And there we introduce some short noise, which, which is a specific noise we have at the end when we do some sampling. And what you can observe is including this noise, in our simulation, well, we retrieve the uh, dissociation curve of this H8 uh, system. So this is a really promising result, and we are now like extending this, uh, this algorithm, trying to go beyond VQ calculation and including uh, quantum phase estimation uh, point of view on this problem. And with this, I, I reach the, the end of my talk. We can discuss just after that. And I would like to give you some take-home messages. So what did I do in, in this talk? Essentially, I talked about NISC algorithms and the point of view some people have concerning development of methodologies and, and quantum computing methods. Okay? And in this case, the rational quantum gun solver is uh, generally at the heart of the current research. A lot of people are focusing on this from different backgrounds, chemistry, informatics, physics, hardware, software. A lot of people are gathered around this. Then I talked about the ansatz and I talked about the hardware efficient approach and the chemistry inspired approach. And I used these two things, uh, I would say, in SIO VQE and also in QDFT. You have practical illustration of use of this ansatz. 
And I talked about Ensemble VQE has a way to go beyond only uh, VQE calculation to get access to the ground state of a given Hamiltonian. And I, I use this uh, approach in two quantum algorithms, one for with wave function and another one based on the density functional theory. SAO VQE for wave function theory perspective, where I, I demonstrated that this algorithm could be not including the noise for the moment, but it will be capable of describing conical intersection, giving access to important information for photochemistry application. QDFT, we are here, we demonstrated that actually there is the new paradigm that is DFT, and it comes also on a quantum computer with a new point of view on the mapping we could use. And if you make the, the comparison, wave function theory, you would have the same number of qubits, as the number of spin orbitals, and here you have a logarithm number of, of qubits, logarithmic number of qubits, which is particularly appealing for near term application. And we show that, well, we can expect interesting results out of it. And with this, well, I would like to thank you for your attention. And now, if you have uh, questions or if you want to post some discussion after that, I would be really glad to, to have this discussion with all of you.